Okay, so uh, up to now we learned uh, how to apply very simple, uh, say, local rules uh, just to change some say, local property, the styling uh, of some fonts and uh, uh, text and so on. As I mentioned, uh, uh, on Mozilla Development Network, and in the end you can find all the attributes, uh, all the properties that can be changed with CSS. And you see that there are hundreds of them. So it takes a while you know, to, to, to manage at least uh, uh, the, the key portion of them, okay? Uh, for example, uh, this morning we were, uh, the, the, the hour before we were talking about the tables, uh, and uh, you can find maybe other tutorials that uh, uh, specifically sh show you how to use and which properties to use, maybe border, and width, and so on, uh, for uh, creating a table. No? For example, uh, the difference between these borders here and the uh, normal theme borders lies in this attribute border collapse. Uh, uh, so there are, there's a lot of uh, uh, say information and a lot of knowledge uh, for creating um, effective style sheets. We'll try to take a shortcut. Hmm? Uh, first of all, we when we, so it's easy, but relatively easy to style the single elements, fonts, colors, backgrounds, uh, italics, style, and so on. It becomes much more complex when we are trying to reprogram the layout algorithms. Right now we see, we know the box, uh, sorry, the block algorithm and the, lay, and the inline algorithm. What happens if we want to make some more complex layout? You know, two columns, for example, of text or uh, a text flowing uh, um, around a picture, or a grid of a pictures, or something like that. Uh, we need to uh, have access to more sophisticated layout algorithms. That they all are based on, the, uh, on a say, visual primitive that is put together by the browser. Every element in the browser is uh, a box. So you have a table, it will be a box. The title of the table is a box. A row is a box. A cell of the table is a box. A letter is a, is a box. A word is a box. A, a title line is a box. Everything is a box. Okay? From the visual point of view. From the logical point of view, an HTML page is a hierarchy, a tree of nodes. JavaScript nodes. From the visual point of view, it's just a, a positioning of boxes. And every box has some properties to determine its size. So we have rules for determining the size of the boxes and rules for determining how the boxes align to each other. Okay? Uh, the sizing rules are very easy. A box is made of a main content. So, for example, if you have a letter A, that would be the size of the letter A with the specific um, font type and font size. This is the real content. Of the, if you have an image, that will be the size of the image. Maybe you can resize it, whatever, but that will be the, uh, the physical space occupied by the content itself. And then this content, which is always a rectangle, with rectangular shape, is uh, you know, included uh, in a set of nested rectangles that are called the padding, the border, and the margin rectangles. Um, all of three, padding, border, and margin, may have different thickness, may have zero pixel, maybe just disappear, or may have a given measure, a number of pixels, number of centimeters, number of millimeters, whatever. And they add up. And the, on the four sides, on the four top, uh, bottom, left, and right, they may have different measures also. What is the difference between the three you know, uh, surrounding rectangles is that the padding is a sort of a no collision area for the content. It's an internal margin. So, I'm, okay, this is my space, but around my space, I want some additional measure that is, is sort of an extension of the content. The padding has always the same background color as the main content. 
you see here is gray and continues to be gray. Okay, so if you want to avoid the elements to be too, um, to touch each other, you want to have some space, you can say, you can give up some padding to each of the elements. Will be part of the element itself. Then we have the border. The border is something that usually is a, of a different color than the padding itself. Okay? Um, and so it's something visible. It can be thinner or thicker, but something we draw around, around all the four sides, or maybe around only two of the sides, or whatever we want. And it's in addition, so outside the padding, we have the border. And then, outside the border, we have the margin. The margin has the same background color of the father, of the container element. So if the content has a specific background color, this color is propagated to the padding. The margin is outside the element. So it takes the same background as the surrounding elements, as the, back, as the, as the higher container. Okay? So of course, if Padding and margin have the same color, all, and the border is also, uh, is, everything will be invisible. But uh, we have these three measures that can be, and what, what is the purpose of the margin is, again, to keep the borders or the content of the element separated by at least that margin number. Okay? So the margin is a minimum spacing in the background of the element, the padding is the minimum spacing inside the element, between the element and its border. And the border is something that we draw. Uh, one rule is that the margins merge. So if I have an element with a margin 10 and another element with a margin 15, I put them one besides the other, the overall margin will be only 15. Okay? But of course, the, the, the bigger of the two. The margins can overlap because they are part of the background, actually. The, why the border and the padding are like solid walls. You cannot compenetrate them. Hmm? You see in the inspector, all of these, where is the browser? Yeah. In the inspector, you see all of these properties, all of these box properties here in this box model that gives me the size of the content and it cannot be changed. The size of the content depends only on the content itself. It's a bottom-up layout algorithm. First, let's create the content. Then, let's surround the content by these uh, rectangles, these margins, paddings, and borders. And finally, let's put together all the rectangles. So, for example, here, this uh, word derusis has no margins, no padding. It's, they are all zeros here, right? While if I take another element, for example, answers, it has some, no padding, no borders, but it has some margins on the top and the bottom. Why? Because H2 is a, some predefined styles by the browser. If I don't like them, maybe I, for me it's too much spacing, so I can reduce it to 10 or whatever. On both sides, maybe. Okay, right now I'm changing that interactively to make it persistent. I need to add a rule for changing the margin bottom properties. You see that while I was editing this, the inspector told me what are the properties I was, I was modifying. And if I want to add a, a border, I, have a, I may have a border of one pixel that just draws a border in the text color below the title. So maybe it's, it's nicer to look at. And here I have the properties that I could put, you say, the style of the, bot, uh, the border, the, the, the thickness of the border in the bottom. No? So there are all the properties here. This can change uh, spacing of the elements. Still, we are 
uh, in a block level element. So this element will still uh, occupy all the, the full width of the page and all the other elements uh, will be below and abo above and below it. So nothing on the side. But we, we may uh, we may change the algorithms used for layout elements, and this is the, where the tricky parts come. So every element, just remember, is in a box. These measures that we can program with properties just uh, extend in some way the box around each element. That can be useful for creating a lot of visual effects. We have actually, you see, uh, four, eight, uh, 12 measurements for the three levels on the four sides, plus all the properties concerning the thickness, uh, sorry, not the thickness, it's already in the measurement, the color and the style. So you can change the color, can, the style can be dotted, dashed, uh, solid, and so on. So there's a lot of properties around them. Plus there are some ex extra properties for rounding the corners. So uh, I said that they were rectangles, but sometimes they can be displayed, for the, especially the, the border can be rounded. So in a way, no, there will be more margin and less padding because we have a, a rounded corner. And so the radius of the rounded corner in the four corners can be changed. So a lot of shapes can be done just by customizing the boxes. But then we have uh, the different uh, layout algorithms. First of all, the two main ones are inline and block that are predefined, but they could be applied. So they could turn for example, a paragraph into an inline element instead of a box level element. So for example, I, if I wanted, it's not something I suggest to do, but there are these two paragraphs. I wanted to put them one besides the other. What I could do is not a good idea, but what I could do is say, okay, these two paragraphs, I want them to lay out using the inline algorithm instead of the block algorithm. It should only change a, a property called display. And so I want to say that uh, my uh, what, what, what the ID? question text and author name. Question text. Author name. Display. Display in line. It should work, maybe. Yeah. These two are now side by side instead of above and below. Maybe I should align on the right the second one, so on. There's a lot of stuff to do. Okay. Just to show that uh, the layout algorithm is just a property of the node. If I change the layout algorithm, the node will behave in a different way. It's a paragraph of text that is no longer applying, uh, occupying all the row. It's only occupying the minimum space around it. Hmm? So it's very easy to, to move stuff around in this way. And, there are, and these are the two basic alg uh, positioning uh, uh, algorithms that work on the display property. But by the way, there, is, uh, there was some, uh, sorry, one slide before that I wanted to show you. We can change, okay, the display property but uh, uh, in some cases, uh, we can use also the display property for showing or hiding information. So there is another display algorithm, layout algorithm, which is called none. Uh, so we can effectively have an element that is in the page, but it, won't, but it, it disappears, it's not there. We prepare it, but it won't be, the layout, will, uh, the layout algorithm will just ignore that that node and all, all of its children. So it's good for preparing, I don't know, an error box, but you don't show the error box until there is a real error. You lay that out, you prepare it, but you mark it hidden. Not display none. Uh, or another possibility is using the visibility attribute that can be hidden or no. Um, the difference is that a hidden element still occupies some space, but it's transparent while a display none element uh, collapses, uh, so the space can be occupied by the rest of the page. It just really disappears. So there's nice tricks that we can use with, the, with playing with the layout algorithms. But for doing real, layout, um, 
layout. These lights, I, I skipped it. These are all the details of the cascading style sheet. The rules for which, if they have, more, if you have more than one right rule that applies to the same element, which rule wins? Hmm? It will take just two weeks for that. But hopefully, we 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 don't we don't need to go into such a detail. Uh, these lights uh, summarizes some more intelligent uh, layout uh, algorithms that were de were developed during the years uh, in different CSS versions. So the first CSS version had a very, so the, the, the goal of the layout is to position blocks of pages, to make columns, uh, to make something aside of the other, and so on, the, the normal layout of the page. Not the, the micro layout, uh, just done with the box, box model, but the macro layout uh, requires some more intelligence. The uh, first uh, version was the float algorithm, that make the, some parts of the page float with respect to the others. So the idea is that you have an image and you can have the text float around the image, not just the text. It was quite complex to use, basically, because there was a lot of corner cases and uh, there were people that were expert in that in creating two column layouts, three column layouts, and so on. Then we have more modern layout algorithms that are called grid and flex that were available in CSS version 3 and, uh, and so on, uh, that are you know, uh, already do the work for us, okay? So the, the, um, the, the, fl the floating, or the, the, uh, what to say, the basic uh, um, algorithms uh, rely on the positioning of blocks uh, with respect to each other. So, Right now, just imagine each of these blocks is not just one word or one title, but it's a part of the page. The browser has normally a, a, a pretty fine layout. And then we can act on top of this layout by moving the element relative to its position, relative to the beginning of the page, relative to the beginning of the window which are not the same if you are scrolling the page, okay? So you want to something to be always on top. Even if you scroll the page, you anchor that to the window. If you want something to be on top of the page, but of course, if you scroll, it will disappear, you anchor that to the top of the page. Or if you have something that you want to move, maybe more on the right or on the left, then the its default position, you can move it. And you, you can do that with some positioning that can be static, relative, or absolute, or fixed. There are these four uh, attributes. Okay, so you are, you are, you are saying to the, to the browser, apply the normal layout algorithm, and then change something. Hmm? These are, low, as you can imagine, low-level mechanisms. How, much, how many pixels do we need to shift it to the right or, or to the top? It's good for very simple things like fixed... Uh, bars or something like that. Um, and these are the basis for the floating mechanisms. I will only spend a very few time because it's too low level for you to be <laughs> manageable. Um, some elements may float and means that uh, their layout uh, is uh, independent from the rest of the page. So they are positioned in the left or center or right corner first, and then all the rest will uh, just wrap around in this way. And then, of course, we need some rules uh, to say, okay, when the float is starts uh, and finishes, and so, so the, the, the command was clearing the float uh, because uh, in some cases the text around uh, is shorter than the image, uh, and so you don't want this uh, break here. So it, the concept is quite simple. You position something and the rest just goes around, uh, but the, its implementation is full of special cases that made it difficult to to use. Um, so here are some examples uh, of how people did layouts uh, in the earlier times. Okay, so with a lot of uh, boxes uh, that maybe maybe usually div blocks uh, with very careful styling of each of them. And it was different if we wanted to do have two columns or three columns, uh, or if the main column was the central one or, or the right one, you had to do a real, really different work. That was the past. I don't want to remember that. 
um, then we have more intelligent algorithms for example if that are useful today and quite easy to use one is uh, if you want to uh, align elements in a sort of grid that, that doesn't need to be a rigid grid it can be flexible like this you see that there are some elements that are aligned vertically and horizontally but some element can take more space uh, than others uh, can span different rows span different columns uh, and it will be your engine for laying out the content of the page. And this element can expand vertically, horizontally, as you want. Uh, so you are dividing, and many pages are, are, have a um, uh, grid-like grid layout, some aligned layout. And how do you define a grid? Oh, it's quite easy. Um, you just mark, display, grid, on the container that all the elements and every children of this container will be one element in the grid you just, you just declare for example you have a page that you want to lay out in this way you have a section with some inside elements if you specify that the section has the grid algorithm then the children of the section will be the cells of this grid. So the immediate children will be the blocks that are aligned into the grid. And then how, the, how they are aligned, where, where they are positioned, depends on a set of uh, uh, attributes. For example, you can define on the section the width uh, the, and the height of the rows minimum and maximum height and width of the rows and the columns. Uh, uh, FR is a special unit that means uh, everything. Okay, one fraction means uh, the totality of the space that is available. And so you are, in a, in a way, saying that the central column and the central row of the tree will expand as much as possible. We push the boundaries and try to compress all the rest. And the rest will have this minimum, uh, or actually not minimum because this is pushing uh, the actual size. So you define the rule of the grid, and then you specify the different uh, header, nav, article, which are the, the components. Where do you want to put them? Row two, column one, and so on. You can also let uh, the algorithm position the element itself. So if you don't want to position them, it will just occupy the next free cell itself. Hmm? So again, this grid is invisible. It doesn't have lines and columns or, or borders or whatever. It's just uh, positioning and aligning elements. Um, and then there are tricks uh, for creating cells that span multiple rows, multiple columns, uh, uh, for visualizing grids, lines, and so on. Everything with these attributes. Right? And so it's very easy to have a, a two-column layout, uh, just a grid with two elements. And the first one of fixed length uh, and the second fixed width, sorry, and the second one with the uh, full width. Um, and this is good for grid-like content, okay? So you may have in one page different grids, uh, and the key is just uh, having a container element with a display grid attribute, and so it will do all the work on its children, first-level children. The same concept, uh, marking the algorithm on the container and then letting the, the, the children do the work, is uh, for that, uh, 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 this, uh, this new algorithm, the newest one, it's called Flexbox, uh, which is an alternative to grids. Uh, so you can use grids or floats, uh, or sorry, or flex, uh, or maybe both of them in different parts of the page. They mix, okay? Sometimes if you nest them, they mix in a not so easy to predict ways, but anyway. Um, the idea of, of Flexbox is that you can create uh, layouts that are more flexible than just grids, okay? Uh, it's a sort of a floats uh, as they should work, not without all the problems that they had the first level floats. Um, again, you define a container and saying that the layout, the display of the container is flex, and then you access the children. You, what can you control with flex? You can control the alignment, so all the children with Layout and align to the left or to the right, um, horizontally, vertically. 
you can shift the order so maybe the first the second element will be shown in third position you can reorder them like in grid also in grid you can position the elements inside the grid it doesn't need to be in the order in which they are in the HTML you can change the size and usually you can say okay I want all of them to be of the same size or I want these to be twice the size of the others so you give relative proportions and the algorithm will stretch the elements uh, to fit those uh, requirements um, by default the items will just lay out uh, and when they finish the available space they just continue in the next row or in the next column depending on whether you're using an horizontal or vertical layout so they are they have this sort of inline behavior um, and from the point of view of the CSS attributes it's quite easy you just say to the container that it's a flex and maybe specify how you want to justify the content that you want to align where if you want to space uh, around the space in between no space at all and so on so there, again there are maybe 15 different properties of the flex family but each of these properties does a lot of work for you already okay and especially they are flexible in the sense that they adapt to the size of the window uh, you are never specifying i want 27 pixels here you're specifying you want at least 10 10 percent of the page size for example or just use the available space and divide it by three and divide it between the different elements okay uh, the wrapping I, I, do I want it or not uh, the alignment uh, horizontally and vertically so you can justify it or not so there's a lot of properties uh, each of uh, on these slides uh, no, each property gives you some visual examples of how they behave um, all of these pictures are taken from the links that are in the first page here of the um, it's a tutorial on flex and basically we have this handful of, of basic properties okay this is again we should we should maybe learn no? all of these properties in order to create our own layout or um, we could use a framework that already contains some rules uh, that are already ready to use okay so the lazy way is just to use uh, some already existing uh, CSS library and try to use it so maybe instead of maybe spending hours in trying to learn and define our rules we try to use a set of rules. Maybe we don't like it, but at least it's a starting point. Then we can customize them. So instead of starting from the default rules of the browser, which are very ugly, as we saw, we start with something which is more you know, uh, modern or more complete. And then we can add our own rules. And uh, with our suggestion, there are many CSS frameworks out, out there that do the job. Our suggestion is to use uh, and with the bootstrap okay, framework, which is quite easy to use. Um, Getbootstrap.com. This the, is the layout system that was developed uh, years ago by Twitter. Hmm? And uh, a lot of websites use that, so you will recognize the style. How to use uh, uh, these styles in our, in our web website? Okay, well, there's a, a good deal of documentation about uh, uh, Bootstrap, and basically what they say is uh, you should import in your project the CSS from the Bootstrap project. And they already put it online for you. So instead of importing my own CSS file, I will import that from the library, CSS library. And that will automatically apply some set of default styles to my website. Default, default for, for Bootstrap. And then, but this will be very minimal. 
and then I will use uh, basically some classes to apply to some elements to customize what I want to, to achieve, okay? Um, so let's try to, the only problem is that we, let's use version 5.2 instead of 5.3 because it, when we move to React, uh, the actual supported version is only 5.2. Okay, so we need to modify our uh, HTML file by including this uh, viewport specification that basically is taking the measurement of the screen. So let's go to the HTML. Okay, it's already here. And we modify this link statement, let's comment our own link statement, our own style sheet, and insert this one here, plus some script in the last lines before the end of the body. This is a little JavaScript that is used for some functionality of Bootstrap, okay? So it should be included if we want uh, some components to work. So we, add, we are only added two lines, one in the head and the other before the end of the body. And if I reload this page, uh, where is the browser here? It's again black and white because I removed all my styles. But it's already better looking than before. The font is cleaner, okay, something like that. So these are the default styles applied by Bootstrap, which are, of course, not okay, especially the margins are very bad because it's, uh, there are no margin on the left. This is because the Bootstrap uh, uh, takes control of a part of the page using an element that they call container. So you should isolate, we should isolate the part of the page that we want uh, Bootstrap to, to control inside a div which is called container, with a class container. Everything are, will be classes. Hmm? So for example, the first, uh, so the first uh, uh, modification we need to do is to... Uh, No, 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 not here. Hmm? To put our, no, the most basic layout element uh, in Bootstrap are containers. And if you put your content inside a container, you can use uh, all the positioning algorithms that Bootstrap already defined in, uh, in their own CSS files. So in our case, there are three, two different uh, uh, containers. One is called the container, and the other is called container fluid. Um, the difference is that the fluid will only, always occupy 100% of the page when you reside the window, while the container will occupy a fixed width that depends on the browser size. But if you change a bit the browser size, the, the width will be the same. If you shrink it too much, of course, it will be uh, laid out in a, in a smaller size. So the easiest one is container but it's the same. Uh, and so we put, for example, all the content in, our, in a div plus container. Or container fluid depends. Huh? So we need to close the div at the end. And this will automatically or immediately change the margins a bit. This is a container, so the width is uh, fixed. But you see that it manages the margin in a more or less intelligent way. So depending when you increase uh, too much, uh, okay, it, it will increase the width of, of, the, of the body and decrease the margin and so on. These are, by, by the way, all these behaviors are done by using the flex algorithm. So uh, Bootstrap is based on flex, 
but it's already, you know, all, all the main rules are already programmed there. So we have this container, and the main uh, uh, advantage of, of Bootstrap is that it gives us the so-called responsive layout. So the layout can adapt to the size of the screen. Of, uh, other than giving us a uh, you know, useful style. So what do we mean by responsive layout? We mean that the same website can be displayed in different devices, but of course in different devices the layout rules will be different. This is based on a specific uh, attribute in a CSS that in some way queries the size of the device. And what it does is it's a media selector, it's called media selector, that says, okay, let's apply this rule if the screen has a minimum width of 900 pixels, for example. So by defining a set of rules in this way, you can have rules that apply only when the screen is a minimum or a maximum size. And so all the layout rules uh, can you know, uh, change according to the size of the layout. Ah. Again, this is a low-level mechanism, and Bootstrap already uses that for giving us a higher-level, uh, say, interface for that. The idea is that uh, depending on the screen size, the same content, so the same HTML, without modifying anything in the HTML, the elements in the HTML will receive different styles according to the width, and the layout will be different. So we are programming several layouts in the same way, in the same time, at the same time. We don't need to program three different layouts. One layout with some rules for degrading, in a way. So maybe when we uh, reduce the size, something will may disappear. We don't need to show it anymore. Something will move up, something will move down. Something that move from a size to below, and so, and so on. The idea for programming this layout in an easy way is, uh, in, and is used by Bootstrap, but, may, but also by other libraries, is to divide the screen logically in 12 columns. And when you position an element, you decide, you define how many columns uh, that will take, that element will take. And you can define the number of columns according to the screen size. Bootstrap has, uh, where is the browser here? Has uh, one, two, three, four, five, six uh, predefined screen sizes, screen sizes that cause breakpoints. Uh, big breakpoints because it depends uh, on this number of pixels. Depending on your screen size, uh, it uh, uh, you fall into one of these categories. So what you can do is to say, okay, if my screen, okay, let's make an example, question and author. If the screen is wide enough, I want them to be side by side. Let's assume if I, if I have 12 columns, uh, that the first one takes six columns and the second one takes another six columns. If the screen is smaller, I want them to be one below the other. And so both of them should take 12 columns. So by taking more columns, I usually I'm taking more columns if the columns are narrower. And so there will be less, less stuff on my left and right sides. Okay? So this is what makes uh, uh, responsiveness. There are some examples here in the website of Bootstrap, uh, where, for example, we have a, a content which is made of three columns. How do they do that? They have a container, and they divide this container in a sort of a macro grid made of rows and columns. So they use class row and class column for making a macro, micro grid. By default, these three columns will have the same size. Okay? Uh, but then you can specify the number of columns to occupy out of the 12 available ones 
for small screens, for medium screens, for large screens, and so on. Um, so this is an, an example, okay, of uh, two rows. The first one with two columns, they will automatically take uh, six columns each. Six grid positions. We have three, they will take one third, so four, 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 okay? And this will be for all the screen sizes. If you want to make one of them wider than the others, you can say, okay, this column will occupy six columns. The second one, two. So I have 12. The central one takes six, and the other one will divide evenly the rest uh, of uh, six, three and three. So we'll have three, six, three columns each. Or maybe five, and so the, the other will share less space and so on. And these are, will apply at all resolution. And then there are some rules that only apply at some resolution. So this, what is this rule saying? This element uh, call, okay, it's a normal column that shares the space with the others. But if the screen is large, it will occupy two columns. It means if the screen is large, I only take two out of 12. If the screen is smaller, I may expand because two are not enough anymore. So this one of three, if I, sorry, if I re resize the screen, what you see, this is large, so this is narrow. When I reduce this, the, the size of the browser, this is the same one of three, still selected, but now it's taking one third of the space. Because the rule that is saying, it, I only occupy two, columns is, does not apply anymore because I'm not in a large screen anymore. So you lay out for the small screens and then give the exception for the larger sizes. And in this case, by the way, if you exceed, then automatically when it it cannot fit the, the content in the number of columns, it will automatically shift to a vertical position. So this is done automatically in, in a very declarative way. You just specify with the classes how do you want them to behave, and then Bootstrap does all the rest. Okay, we say example eight and four, which is normal, and then if you want to uh, each of these, uh, say, measurement can be personalized. Let's try to read this. SM08, SM4, or small, small, small. Okay, this is the, happens at all breakpoints uh, larger than small. So if, if the screen is small or larger, you have this 8 and 4 split, or we have this three equal columns. If you go below, so you go to extra small, uh, sorry, why is that uh, here? So I need to shrink it a lot. They will become vertical because the attribute column doesn't apply anymore. It's not a column anymore, so it will stack vertically because the the, the rule 4 and 8 only applies if the screen is 567 pixels, at least small. It takes a while because at least I find it counterintuitive that the smaller the screen, the higher the number of columns. So, and when you specify something, it will be for a given minimum size. Okay, so when you specify, what is that? Column medium four means that this will take four columns on medium or larger screens. And in other screens, it will take six columns, for example. So this will be, for small screens, six columns means 50% of the screen. 
for larger screens will be four columns, uh, means uh, one third of the screen. And of course, these are three elements of the, of the same rule. If they take one third, they will be one third and one third, one third on the same row. If the screen is smaller and this rule applies, one half of the, there will be one, two on the side, and this third one on the bottom, below them, of course, because six, six, uh, six plus six is already 12, and the next one should go in the next row. So, for example, in our, <coughs> in our website, what we could do, uh, we had the problem of this uh, author and name. We can use this. Maybe by applying, uh, okay, let's create a div just for the sake of, uh, it's not needed in this case, but, no, it's needed, sorry. And say, so, okay, these two are to be treated as a row. So applying the row class here. And then I specify how to manage this row. For example, I say class. This is a column. I don't need the ID anymore. And again, this is a column. So by default, these we should be laid out uh, side by side. By distributing evenly the space. If I want to have more space for the question and less for the author, okay, let's change them, let's make eight and four. Column eight and column four, for example. So I have more space there. Then I can align on the right the author name or whatever. And if I want it to, to be resizable, well, I don't have any responsive and rules. So right now it's still applying the eight and four rule. Just the columns are, are narrower. So I, if I want uh, uh, to, to, to change it, I should specify that this division, 8 and 4, is only from medium screen. And for the smaller ones, uh, I just want them to be one below the other. So maybe I have specified that this is only for medium screen. So if I reload this, or medium was larger than imagine. For medium and large screens, they are, and if I shrink it more, they go one below the other. So they're responding this way. I can, of course, have more than one class on the same element if I want to have more steps in redefining the layout. Okay? So maybe it's not medium, but let's say small because it's easier to, to see. Okay, and okay, when I go, this is the, the small breakpoint here. Um, we also mentioned something about the tables. So this is the first, the, the, you know, you know, the main uh, uh, function of, um, of Bootstrap is managing the layout. Uh, if you have two columns or whatever, I have one row, two columns, and inside this column we may have and a lot of content, not just a single sentence, is not a problem. And then we lay out the full page. And one other, one other question we had before was the, the table. Okay, you just had, you have one class, which, one class which, which is called table, that immediately applies a modern looking table style, the title with the rows and so on. without, you know, to reach the same uh, alignment and, and uh, separation and so on, it would have taken us two hours at least, probably. But uh, uh, with just one class uh, applied to, and of course, this is the minimum uh, the minimum amount of layout we can, we can apply. But if we want, where is this? Sorry, there was some here, I'm 
sorry, there was some page that was displayed all the uh, contents. No, layout, grid content. Oh, I am searching out oh, tables here. You have a section about tables with all the options you want to apply by just adding some, uh, uh, some attributes, some new classes. For example, you can change uh, row colors by using the six uh, colors, just by adding a class to the table, to the row, or to the, day, or to the cells. You can have uh, striped tables in this way. You can change, of course, the size of the columns uh, so I have different proportion for that, uh, dark style, no, uh, all, all of different variations just by playing, you see the code just by playing a, a, a couple of attributes or classes here and there. So this gives us a, no, uh, a way of obtaining a decently looking web page with, with no or very little effort. And of course then we can customize it uh, as we want because uh, we'll see much better about the, the forms, uh, creating forms. You see there's a lot of, lot of documentation. Buttons, uh, again, we have the buttons in different styles. Uh, we use the button HTML element and then basically the idea is always the same. We have some classes and these classes will modify the lookout, the outlook and uh, modify the behavior in some cases of the elements. And you may have buttons of different styles, uh, empty ones, uh, just uh, uh, appearing as uh, enabled or disabled. So if we, if we are using, of course, it will take some time to play and to explore the different possibilities. Okay, uh, it's uh, quite well organized. The documentation is quite well organized because you see, you select buttons and it will tell you every option about the button. You see tables, you say it will tell you how every. Vi variation with examples. So, it will of course, it will take some time to explore, but uh, uh, you, you don't need to search in an alphabetical reference. The philosophy here is a bit different. Instead of setting selectors and properties in CSS, we nearly never select the properties directly, but we change the classes. So we add or remove classes to some element to obtain some, ele some, some effect that is already defined by, by Bootstrap. Okay, so of course everything relies on CSS. But for working on a higher level, we should ask ourselves not just what are the properties I need to make this underline, for example, but what is the class provided by Bootstrap to have this effect. If I'm using the Bootstrap classes, I already know that they play well together. I don't risk of forgetting some corner case or something when it's resized or it's hidden uh, or, the, or the space is not right and so on. So it, this is true for every framework. I have already a lot of work done for me, but I have to follow the rules. I, I have to learn their way of doing things. Bootstrap is quite easy. In this case, it's not very invasive in, in a sense yeah, because you can just, if you don't, apply any classes, you just get some simpler fonts and so on. And as you apply more classes, you can have more, more styling and more, more effects. Hmm. Um, in these utilities, you, can, you also have some lower level commands if you want. For example, if you want to change the background yourself, uh, uh, you have some BG classes that you can apply everywhere just to force a background even if the normal styles would not apply. If you want to uh, specify some borders, uh, you, okay, I want a border, I want a border on, on one side, uh, on all sides uh, of the color and so on. So in some way you have also some low level control. You can always set the property yourself, but first of all, let's, let's search if there is already something uh, for us, okay? Setting the colors of the text, of the background. So, Simple things can also be done with classes. They already predefine some colors that are uh, placed nice together, are not ugly to see like we did before. And, um, but usually you get the control over the, you see there's a section flex 
where you can use the flex algorithm directly, you're just using them with a D prefix, so D flex D, which is a class defined by Bootstrap that uses flexes and fixes some already some, some behavior. So if you need some finer control, you can go to this uh, say utilities section, which is the middle level API that they were using also for creating the components, uh, forms, uh, and content. These three content, forms, and the components are the main uh, classes that we can use uh, in, in Bootstrap. There are also some say, powerful components. For example, this, this one accordion that does all this work for you, that already manages the expand and collapse and show and hide and the, the animation, you just have to put a couple of, of classes here and there. Okay, so hopefully this will you know, uh, make our development a bit quicker, even if the uh, no the the other the, the back of the of the coin the flip back of the coin is that all the website will look like more or less the same, but at least we can move on in, with our dynamic part. Okay, it was. You know, uh, a rushy uh, class, uh, you had to touch a, a lot of topics, uh, but the end point is try you know, to have already a, a mental model in mind of how to develop this front-end application. Don't lose yourself in the details. Uh, clean HTML, classes, and bootstrap, and then focus on the content. Okay? Next week, we'll add some interactivity. I will try to publish during the week uh, a full version of this page. Mm, hopefully, well done. Uh, so they can have a look at a complete page and not just some example that we did here and there. Okay, thank you for this morning. <laughs>